can we start now yeah yes we can start uh there was a time when even the thought of flying was a myth but today any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic it has advanced to a point where even the most unheard of inventions are making a breakthrough and a major one amongst all these inventions is 3d bioprinting technology good afternoon everyone i am srinivas panigrahi a sophomore from genesis the bioengineering club of nit raurkela i welcome you all to the second day of our annual conference genex conference 2.0 emphasizing new perspectives and advances before starting the session i deem it a privilege to introduce our guest speaker dr vignesh muthu vijayan dr vignesh muthu vijayan did his btech in chemical engineering from ac tech anna university india he pursued his masters degree in chemical and biochemical engineering at the university of maryland baltimore and a phd in chemical engineering at oklahoma state university he also worked as a post doc at john of hopkins university after spending about 8 years in the united states he returned to india to join the department of biotechnology at iit madras in 2010 he received the early career research award in 2018 from science and engineering research board serb for giving a proposal on development of economical bioactive double network hydrogels for combinatorial treatment of diabetic wounds he is a course instructor of various courses like uh, biological rate processes biomaterials engineering drug delivery and many more he also offers nptel courses on materials and and energy and balances and tissue engineering now by moving ahead i would like to request dr vignesh muthu vijayan to grace the virtual stage with his presence without any further delay over to you sir sir please continue Thank you. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm glad to be a part of the uh, program, and uh, I hope today's event would be useful and interesting for the students. Uh, so let me share my screen, and I'll start with uh, talking about uh, what 3D printing, 3D bioprinting, and its applications could be. So uh, just give me a second. Let me share the screen. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Uh, yes. So, are you able to see the full screen, uh, or is it uh, is, is the presentation in full screen mode? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, so, good afternoon, everybody. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, 3D bioprinting is going to be the main aspect which I'm going to talk about, but. Uh, what i want to do is uh, give an introduction about tissue engineering and then establish how uh, 3d bioprinting is going to be uh, supporting this tissue engineering while it is being done okay so uh, that is going to be the theme of this uh, presentation so uh, we will first be talking about uh, just one second not able to see it in full screen this uh, give me one second let me actually uh, let's stop sharing and screen share it again there seems to be some problem okay so uh, yeah so what i as i was saying we will be talking about uh, the applications of uh, 3d printing so which means the work is going to be starting with respect to uh, tissue engineering so uh, the main thing we are going to Uh, do is use 3d bioprinting as a tool uh, to actually uh, solve tissue engineering problems 
So with that in mind, I wanted to first give an introduction, a brief introduction of what tissue engineering is and uh, talk about how we can uh, use 3D printing uh, for tissue engineering applications and what are the basic concepts with respect to 3D bioprinting and so on. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, why do we want to talk about uh, tissue engineering? What is the motivation behind tissue engineering? So what uh, all of us know is uh, injury, a disease and congenital malformation can result in tissues losing their uh, functionality. So when this happens, uh, it can seriously affect the quality of life of a person or can even lead to death. So uh, what we would uh, love to have is restore the damaged body so that uh, there is no tragedy which happens. If the life should go on, the quality of life should be maintained. And that is what uh, we as humans aspire to achieve. Right? So uh, although this seems like a dream which anybody would have had from the dawn of a uh, human race, this uh, is not actually easily achievable because of the challenge we face, which is life in itself. Right. So understanding life and being able to emulate life is not simple. And that is where the challenges have been. So please think about this. Um, all of us know this, but if you were to sit back and uh, visualize all organisms, whether it is a mosquito or a human, start from one cell. Right. So basically the cell divides, differentiates, uh, migrates to form uh, various types of tissues and uh, then further differentiates to form organs, organ systems and the entire organism. So it is an amazingly wonderful uh, system. Right? So it is not a simple thing to emulate. When we are talking about creating these tissues in vivo, so in vitro, we are actually looking to uh, engineer the tissues with uh, this kind of precision. We want to make sure that we are able to achieve uh, what nature has achieved. Right? So that is not a simple problem because we still don't fully understand how the tissue develops itself. So once we have a full understanding of uh, the how the tissue develops, then we would have to again recreate it in a lab setup and then take it into a clinical setup and make it uh, translation. Right? So this is a huge challenge which all of us have been struggling with. So uh, what are the current treatments when it comes to uh, damaged tissues? So. Uh, if you can, please unmute yourselves and uh, try and answer or like talk back whenever I ask some questions. So uh, do you know of the current strategies which are used for treating uh, damaged tissues? Anybody? So stem cells. Okay, stem cells. Yes, stem cells have been used, but those are not like uh, very well established uh, techniques. So think of uh, more established techniques which have been there for some extended maybe a few decades at least uh stem cells are still at an experimental stage like transplants transplants yes sorry Crafts. Uh, sorry i couldn't hear you grafts allografts grafts, and yeah exactly so autografts allografts so those are the things which people start with right so uh, autograft is what uh, one for uh, one would start with right an autograft is nothing but uh taking tissue from your own body and so the problem with that is there is limited availability and there is also donor site morbidity. So this um, this means you cannot actually use uh, a lot of tissues which is required. And also there can be cases where the functional tissue has lost its function, which means you do not actually have uh, alternate tissue which will be functional. right? So you may get tissue, but it might not be functional. So that could also be a problem. So can you think of uh, an example where autograft is commonly used. Any so auto case of plastic surgery. Yes. So skin, right? So basically skin is something which people use. Also, whether it is uh, treating uh, burn wounds or whether it is uh, plastic surgery or things like that. Yes, people use their own skin. Uh, can you think of anything else? Bones. Okay, so bones have been used in case of uh, accidents where there is like damage. Yes, autografts can be used from uh, like non load bearing bones have been used to substitute load bearing bones. Anything else? Okay, so by 
sorry so the accordant here you okay so bypass surgery is uh, an example right so you actually use a vascular uh, vasculature from uh, your own body to create a bypass for uh, any block in the uh, coronary block okay so that is another example so those are some common examples for autographs then you have allografts allografts are from the same species so uh, the advantage with an allograft is there is actually uh, more availability and but the problem is there is always a risk of uh, disease uh, transmission or injection so uh, even with very well established transplants there is a risk of immune rejection and because of this uh, people who uh, who have an allograft transplanted in their body have to take immunosuppressive drugs throughout their life so most common examples would be like kidney transplant or heart transplant or liver transplant and so on where you do uh, take Trans the organ from another uh, human being. Xeno transplant or xenografts is also something which people uh, have been working on. So this is uh, something where uh, different species can actually be used for getting an organ or a tissue. So this uh, the, there is a high risk of disease transmission and immunological rejection, but there is a lot of availability, right? So that's the advantage of xenograft. Uh, do you know of any example for xenografts? Recently, so a pig heart is pig heart is implanted by in human. Yes. Recently, a pig's heart was implanted in a human. So there is there are also studies in, in now. In human. Human. Yes, yes. Pig's heart in human. So this was a genetically modified pig heart which was implanted in a human being. So people have also been. Uh, so about two days back, there was a report about pig's kidney in a human as well. Uh, so this was in a brain dead uh, human. Uh, they had actually. Insta uh, like uh, transplanted a pig's kidney uh, to uh, to see how it actually works. So this was done uh, by a US team. This was about two days back. So, but these are all more of uh, these are gene edited pigs, right? So this is not like uh, the regular pig's heart which we are taking and implanting it uh, in whole. Because if you do that, uh, it will immediately get rejected. Okay. So, uh, but I'm I'm talking about more clinical examples where people have been using it. Uh, as a clinical practice for an extended period of time. Do you know of any examples of that sort? Okay. So a uh, heart valve is something where uh, people use porcine heart valve and bovine heart valves. So those have been used as xenografts for a long time. Okay. So uh, these are some examples. So obviously, beyond all this, you have materials, which is basically uh, using synthetic materials. Uh, but the problem with that is there is always going to be some inflammatory response. And it also usually has a vascular barrier, which means it does not allow blood vessels to go through. And it creates uh, other complications because of that. Okay, so these are the current treatment strategies. Then, uh, so if you have all these strategies, why are we looking to have uh, tissue engineering? Like, why do we want to engineer tissues in the lab? So, because all of these have their own disadvantages, and engineered tissues would be more specific to the patient. Okay, huh? so that is one possibility. Yeah. So, where you can have a, a patient-specific treatment, uh, like personalized uh, therapy, is possible. That is one uh, important advantage you can bring in. Uh, what would be a more uh, demanding? Sir, immuno rejections are there. So, yeah. So, immuno rejection again, that would be more of personalized medicine that we are talking about. The personalized medicine is definitely uh, the goal, but that's not something which you are going to achieve right away. Okay. So, that's a little farther away. But even before that, we need tissue engineering because it helps us in bridging one important uh, problem, in solving one important problem. Or do you know what that is? Sir, availability okay. of uh, disease-free donor. Yes. Availability of donors is a huge problem. Actually, you're not going to have uh, easily get donors. Uh, so the gap between the number of transplants required and the number of uh, donors available is actually widening every year. Okay. So if you look at the data for US or other countries, you will be able to see that uh, there is a huge gap between the number of people who are on the transplant waiting list and the number of donors. 
okay so uh, in a country like india that becomes even more of a problem because we do not really have a uh, mechanism for uh, organ donation which is uh, streamlined okay so th there are possible you can do it but it's it's not a streamlined process so uh, why i say that is for example in the us uh, when you apply for a license uh, on your, while you are applying for a license you uh, you are uh, registered for uh, organ donation and you can choose to opt out of it if you want but uh, if not you are uh, registered as an organ donor and this is listed in your license so there is actually a small red heart on your license which indicates that you are a, you are an organ donor so uh, in case of uh, some uh, accident the person who uh, who becomes brain dead can be uh, the organs from that patient can be used to help others Right, so this is automatically registered. So they do have a registry. They have a uh, waiting list, and there is like a proper way to register for it. So in, in so in developing nations, that kind of structure is not there, and which leads to a lot more complications. So having something like a a, a basically a pharmacy where I can go and buy an organ would be the best case scenario, right? So if if I uh, know that there is a kidney failure instead of putting myself on a transplant list if i could just walk up uh, to a pharmacy and say that i would like one kidney for uh, this kind of a person right so give some parameters and say i order a kidney and it gets delivered mm, to my uh, hospital bed that would be the uh, greatest accomplishment right so that is what we would like to achieve right? so that is the reason we want uh, to explore tissue engineering so although this term itself is new uh, the references for tissue engineering have uh, existed long before the term was coined so if you were to take up any tissue engineering textbook uh, they would talk about uh, a mythical creature a greek mythological creature called uh, chimera so they will say that uh, this chimera is uh, is an example for how people's imaginations uh, ran wild and how people wanted to enhance tissue functionality uh, in organisms and so on. So uh, in India, we have had our own uh, Hindu mythology where uh, you have had similar examples. Okay, so this is again uh, mythology. So I'm going to preface it. I'm not saying this is science. I'm saying this is uh, people's uh, visualization and an extension to what people were looking for. Looking to uh, uh, like replace damaged tissues or enhance tissue functionality is what uh, tissue or organ functionality is what uh, people have thought of. Right? So here are some examples like Ganesha, uh, Narasimha, Kamadenu, and Yali. Right? So uh, like, Kama, uh, like Yali is actually a South Indian uh, mythological creature. You would see that in a lot of South Indian temples. Okay, so why I have specifically, uh, why I'm specifically talking about Kamadenu and Yali is there is like a very interesting similarity when you look at other cultures, right? So uh, there is uh, the uh, if you're looking at Islam, there is a mythical mythological creature called Al Burak. So you look at this Al Burak, it looks eerily similar to what you would uh, see as uh, Kamadenu, right? So it it basically is a half. Uh, animal and with the woman's head and has wings and tail which is made of peacock and so on right so this is uh, the only difference which i can at least visually see between this and kamadenu is uh, kamadenu is like half cow whereas this one is like um, a white animal which is a half mule half donkey animal so i would i would just assume that's based on uh, the most common animal which people of that era might have seen in their region right so that's all this is and it clearly shows that uh, the people have actually have been thinking of similar things. And uh, Chimera, which I mentioned earlier, uh, also looks uh, very similar to what you see as Yali, right? So uh, you have a lion's head with uh, the tail of a serpent and so on. So this is very similar to what you see in Yali. And uh, in Christian mythology, there is a Tarask, uh, which is basically a dragon with a lion's head uh, and a short uh, legs like a bear and a turtle shell and so on. So uh, it doesn't really matter what these exactly are. But what I would uh, like to highlight here is people have always been uh, imagining or visualizing 
ways in which functionality of tissues can be restored or uh, enhanced okay so uh, there have been folklores of uh, nose transplant in 1000 bc and uh, obviously these are there are no record in history of this but the first recorded history is uh, of plastic surgery done in 800 bc in india this was done by shushruta who is regarded as the father of surgery and uh, he had used skin grafts uh, for reconstructive surgery so then there is like a huge gap where there is no real advancements or records of what was done uh, in the medical field with respect to surgeries but then in the 16th century there were uh, there are reports of uh, nose replacements uh, done in uh, italy so transplantation of teeth cornea and skin were all performed in the 1700s and 1800s although all these surgeries were performed obviously they were not successful because people did not fully understand uh, what immunological rejection or uh, aseptic uh, surgical environments and all were unknown uh, it's so until they got those things uh, done obviously it lead to rejection of tissues and uh, severe uh, infection uh, finally leading to uh, failure of uh, the uh, surgery right so that is what uh, this was but uh, people were still trying so one of the major breakthroughs when it comes to uh, using xenografts kind of thing is uh, when uh, vincenzo uh, bichelli actually showed that uh, tumor cells which are wrapped in a polymer and implanted in a pig uh, showed immunoprotection so this was significant because this meant that you can actually cover the cells with something and protect it from the immune system and this was a very interesting and important discovery and uh, people then tried have tried kidney transplant as early as 1936 and uh, successful uh, transplants were all performed in the 1960s whether it was heart transplant or lung transplant and so on. so the although these are all uh, strategies and surgeries which have been used in the past the major uh, area modern era of tissue engineering as we define it today started sometime in the 1980s okay so uh, what uh, there are a few things which i would like to show as uh, some of the things which have which are very popularly known right so the modern day chimera uh, was something which uh, was developed by uh, charles vacanti in 1997 so uh, the image I'm going to show here is actually a nude or skid mice, which is basically an immunodeficient mice in which uh, a polymer scaffold was placed and it was seeded with cow dechondrocytes. So a, a ear kind of shape was grown on top of the mice. And so this image actually circulated in the late 90s and early 2000s. And many of us actually thought this was like uh, fabricated, but it's not. This is actually a real uh, mice which was developed by uh, Professor Vacanti. Uh, but what happened uh, here obviously is this is a cosmetic year, right? It cannot actually serve, uh, provide the auditory uh, uh, capacity of a year, but it can act as like a plastic surgery uh, to restore your. Uh, uh, restore the look of the uh, face okay. so uh, many other studies have also been done uh, in the recent past so there has uh, this was done in china where a person lost his nose uh, during uh, in a car accident so a nose was grown on his forehead and it was then replaced with his original nose and this actually uh, was reported maybe about five six years back and then uh, there is another case where people uh, have actually grown a forearm, uh, sorry, a year on the forearm. So this image which I have here is of a musician who, for some reason, wanted to have this done. But uh, but this actually this particular surgery has been used uh, to treat uh, veterans in uh, who have uh, military uh, veterans who have actually lost their year. Uh, and as I all uh, as I mentioned, these still are only cosmetic. They do not, they are not functional. They do not have the olfactory or auditory uh, senses of the nose or uh, ear. Okay. So these are some examples where people have used uh, these polymers. So what you see here is the polymer itself is shaped uh, as the organ, right? So how do you do that? Like the polymer which you get is probably a sheet 
uh, which you have or like a block of polymer that you have or a powder or so on right so how do you do this so this is this is basically fabrication so we will uh, so that is where 3d printing comes in okay so how you fabricate these scaffolds is what uh, matters to actually create a uh, particular tissue and uh, 3d printing is one of the tools which can be used for that so we will talk about uh, that so see when you are talking about tissue engineering this is the definition of tissue engineering it was actually the definition was published sometime in uh, early 1990s so it is defined as an interdisciplinary field that applies uh, principles of engineering and life sciences towards the development of biological substitutes that restore maintain or improve tissue function or a whole organ okay so this is the basic outline of what a tissue engineering uh, approach looks like so when a tissue has some problems what you would ideally like to do is use the cells from the patient expand it and grow it on top of a scaffold provide it with uh, the signaling signals so that the actual tissue is formed the uh, functional tissue is formed and it can replace the damaged tissue to cure the disease so this is the idea this is the simplistic representation of what you are looking for okay so uh, how do you achieve that that is usually the bigger challenge uh, each step actually has various challenges so uh, if you were to do a course on tissue engineering we will actually be able to talk about all the steps but uh, in today's lecture i'm going to talk only about the scaffold part and focus on how 3d printing can be used as a tool in developing this scaffold yeah. so uh, when i said a tissue engineering problem there are uh, three things which you can look at here so if you look at this particular uh, cycle there are multiple uh, parameters here but these can be broadly classified into three aspects so when you are looking at creating a tissue what are all the things you need the first thing you need is the cells right so this is the definition we have all studied so uh, when you have cells uh, when you have tissues you have to have cells right cells is what makes tissues we know that so you need cells so these cells could be either uh, mature cells differentiated cells or stem cells okay so uh, then you have your uh, scaffolds so scaffold is basically a matrix on which the cells grow why do you need a scaffold for uh, developing human tissues so so that the cells grow into a specific shape of our interest okay is it only because we want it in a specific shape see what if i am just looking to develop a skin right i don't need it to be in a shape in any shape or so uh, would i still need a scaffold so it will act as an extracellular matrix for the cells he seems so it would act as a matrix for the cells on which the cells can adhere right so uh, basically mammalian cells are adherent cells right so they are they need some surface to which uh, they can attach and then grow so for that reason you need scaffolds so these scaffolds can be of various types so the examples i have given here are all polymers and that's because uh, we are going to talk about uh, 3d printing where mostly polymers are used extensively but uh, you can obviously have other materials as well we will talk about that so other than these two there is also a lot of signals which can help in the formation of tissues whether it is growth factors or like chemical biomolecules and so on or if it is like uh, physical cues like uh, electrical stimuli mechanical stimuli and so on which can all act as signals in forming the tissue so this is called as the tissue engineering triad these three things put together Uh, help in forming the tissues so usually uh, combinations of this are used so uh, in bioprinting also scaffolds are printed along with cells okay so you can also use uh, growth factors and signaling molecules while you are printing so that is also possible okay so there are different kinds of things which you can look at so it's uh, 3d printing is basically the method used for fabricating the scaffold and fabricating the tissue there are various other methods as well so which we will not be talking about but uh, 3d printing is just the more uh, recent development in the field so when you are so I, i mentioned like three different approaches are there for tissue engineering the scaffold based approach is the one uh, where 3d printing is uh, primarily going to be used so there are also strategies where you use only cells 
like uh, one of the students uh, when we started said uh, using stem cells as a treatment right so people just inject stem cells into an injury site and that actually helps in regeneration of the tissue so that is actually a valid strategy to use people have been using it and it has been shown to be successful however uh, that's a cell based uh, strategy so in a scaffold based strategy uh, you can use different types of scaffolds you can actually use metallic scaffolds so what i sh have shown here is actually a metal scaffold uh, so this is a magnesium met metal which can be used for bone formation studies so this one is actually a, a 3d printed magnesium matrix so that is actually you can 3d print anything right so you, uh, it's, but it's not 3d bioprinting because it is not printed along with cells <clears throat> Again, this is a ceramic which has been uh, used. So this is usually used for bone uh, tissue engineering applications. And carbons such as CNT, spirolytic carbon, graphene, etc., have also been used for uh, tissue engineering applications. And polymers have been used extensively. So uh, you see the image here. So this is actually a <coughs> a sem image of a scaffold. Okay. So what you see here is a very random structure with a lot of pores. And uh, this porosity is important so that the cells can migrate into the scaffolds and also it can help in uh, blood vessel formation, nutrient supply, removal of toxins, etc. Okay, so creating this kind of a structure is important. So each tissue actually has various types of uh, ECM and it is important to mimic the natural ECM while you are preparing these uh, scaffolds. Okay, so uh, having said all that, uh, you have also another family of uh, another class of materials which is called composites, which is basically a combination of these uh, things, a polymer plus ceramic or a polymer plus carbon and so on. <clears throat> so those would be called the composites. Okay, so uh, this in itself is specifically not related to 3D printing, although nitinol can be 3D printed, but uh, it is a metal alloy which has been used in uh, implants and tissue engineering. I just like to show this video because it's a cool video for people to see. Uh, this is a, I don't know how many of you know about nitinol. Uh, if you are not uh, familiar with this, this is actually a pretty cool uh, thing to see. So, what you see here is just a water bath and uh, a deformed nitinol then uh, regains its shape right so this is a very cool property of nitinol so this is uh, because nitinol is something called a shape memory alloy so you also have shape memory polymers so basically what you do is you fabricate the material at a particular temperature and uh, it actually they are, remembers the shape even if you deform it at a different temperature once it goes back to the original temperature it will be uh, it will regain its shape so this is very cool because uh, our body temperature is 37 and the ambient temperature room temperature is about 25 so if you are going to uh, have something which is fabricated at 37 you can deform it at room temperature and then implant it in the body and it will regain its original shape Right, so this is usually used uh, for stents and so on. Right, so when you are placing a stents, this is a material that has been used. Okay, so uh, anyways, coming back to fabrication. So we talk about various aspects of fabrication. Uh, various, I said that there are various types of fabrication uh, for scaffolds. So it can be broadly classified as two methods. One is the top-down approach, and the other is the bottom-up approach. In the top-down approach, what you do is the biomaterials are shaped to resemble the tissues and then cells are seeded on these biomaterials. There are many examples for this kind of a process. Like one example, so the scaffold I showed there uh, previously for the polymer scaffold, that was a top-down approach. That, that would have probably been based on uh, freeze-drying technique, which is a lyophilization of freeze-drying technique, which is one fabrication method. Right, so you can also have electro spinning and things like that, which can be done. So the problem is uh, here you do not have any control over how the cells get distributed because the cells will have to migrate into the pores and uh, occupy different regions. So you cannot actually control where the cells are present and where the cells are absent. The ECM micro environment also may not be created, so which is also uh, may, may not be uh, possible because 
micro environment requires a lot of precision which you don't have too much control over in the top down approach the other option is your bottom up approach so where what you do is you take small pieces of cells and materials and you start building the tissue from this uh, these small pieces right so this is a bottom up approach so here the advantage is you have very good control of uh, cell distribution so what you would have is in some regions where you need more cells you can actually place more cells along with the polymer and in regions where you want less cells you can actually just place the uh, material and no cells right so you can actually have a very good control over the spatial distribution of the cells so that is actually a very cool uh, option right so uh, 3d printing is actually a part of the uh, bottom up approach so there are other uh, bottom up approaches as well like soft lithography and uh, self assembly but we will talk about 3d bioprinting today okay yeah. so when we talk about 3d bioprinting uh, what is it that we are looking at so we are basically trying to form complex 3d functional living tissues by using biocompatible materials cells and supporting components right so it is not just uh, so the material if you are just printing the material that is also possible but that's not bioprinting so then that would be more of a, a top down approach right you recreate the matrix and then you seed cells so that would be a, 3d printing can be used as a top down approach whereas 3d bioprinting can be used as a bottom up approach okay uh, so the conventional 3d printing is used for creating cell free scaffolds and then uh, you can seed cells but the complexity is uh, compared to non biological uh, 3d printing compared to the bio 3d bioprinting is uh, you have to consider that cells are actually present here now right so that means there are many other uh, aspects which you have to consider what material can be used whether this material is something in which the cells can be dispersed uh, what are the cell types that can actually get dispersed this way uh, whether the cells will be uh, viable or will they uh, will they be able to grow or uh, will there be any growth factors and differentiation factors which can be loaded uh, will they get degraded during the printing process and what would be the structure in which the cell tissue have to, to be constructed whether uh, the uh, whether you actually want cell distribution in certain way and so on so those are all different complexities that have to be uh, thought of so 3d printing 3d bioprinting uh, has sort uh, a lot of advantages but a lot of questions which need to be addressed as well so currently there are many applications where uh, 3d bioprinting has been studied whether it is tissue engineering of uh, various tissues for to be uh, implanted in the body like examples are skin bone vascular graft tracheal splints uh, heart cartilage etc uh, or it is developing tissue models which is, can be used for uh, discovery uh, research and toxicology and so on right so uh, drug discovery so it is very cool right so tissue engineering has now so uh, when the field itself started transplantation was the main goal of an engineered tissue but now a lot of interest is on developing in vitro disease models and uh, drug discovery so the advantage of doing 3d bioprinting is uh, there is a potential for accurate cell distribution and the high resolution cell deposition and it is also a scalable process and can be cost effective when done in a larger scale the major challenges however are the sensitivity to uh, living cells and there is also uh, issues with respect to vascularization and innervation of these tissues right so you need any tissue needs to have a vascular network and and a neural network so how do you create that as part of your uh, tissues right? so you basically have to have blood vessels and nerves growing together uh, inside the tissue that you are creating how do you accomplish that okay so we are going to talk about so uh, this is the broad thing so how do we go about uh, 3d printing what is the, what are the things that we have to do uh, what is the workflow right so what are the steps that are involved in uh, 3d bioprinting okay first step is imaging okay so sometimes this might not be required if you already have uh, basic images for uh, the printing of the organ but if it is not if you want to reconstruct a tissue or an organ then the first step you do is image so imaging can be done either using something as complicated as a ct scan or an mri imaging 
uh, and then you recreate it using CAD, or you could do something much simpler. Uh, we'll talk about the different methods of imaging as well. Um, but then you have to identify the strategy so of printing. So are you going to start with a cell-free scaffold and then seed cells? Or are you going to be using 3D bioprinting properly and actually dispersing the cells in the material and creating a bio ink that can be printed? Then the next question is, uh, how do you design this bio, bio ink? The bio ink is actually, uh, designing the bio ink is actually one of the major uh, challenges when it comes to 3D bioprinting. That is the research problem with respect to 3D bioprinting. Because 3D bioprinting uh, techniques, the, the printing techniques themselves are very similar to what the uh, 3D printing uh, technology is. So that's why you have, you can actually assemble a 3D printer without too much of a difficulty. You can buy uh, 3D printers for reasonably low cost. So I, I have one in my lab, which is assembled uh, by a company called Twasta. Twasta uh, is also the company which uh, recently 3D printed a house at IIT Madras, right? So that is, so they, uh, it is possible to, uh, create 3D printers, uh, which can be used as bioprinters because you can just translate the same technology. So you imagine 3D, 3D printing a house versus bioprinting a tissue. So how different are the scales? How different are the materials? But still the technology of 3D printing itself is the same. And because of that, the same company is able to develop uh, a printer, which can actually print a house and a printer, which can tissue, uh, print a tissue. But now the challenge is not just about uh, developing the printer, but about the ink. How do you design this ink? What are the things which go into this ink? Whether uh, this ink will have cells, what will be the compatibility? What will be the printability of the ink? Will the, uh, after printing, what will be the fidelity of the printed uh, material and so on? Right? So there are many such questions when it comes to designing the bio ink. Okay, so uh, then finally, choosing the printing technique itself, there are various types of bioprinting. We'll talk about that. And then finally, uh, how do you do uh, post bioprinting uh, treatments? Like in some cases, you might actually have to cure the scaffolds as well to make sure that the fidelity is maintained. In some cases, you might have to allow the cells to grow and there should have to be cells to differentiate and so on. So what are the things which are involved there? Okay, so uh, if you're talking about imaging, so which is the first step, uh, there are various options which are available for you. So 3D scanner is probably the simplest one. It's the less expensive, it's very fast. <clears throat> Images are, can be created uh, very easily. But the problem is the data is very superficial and uh, very low accuracy. So the resolution you have is only up to five millimeters. Uh, but the advantage is you can acquire this in a very few, uh, in a few minutes. CT is a lot more uh, accurate, but it's also uh, a little more time consuming and more expensive. Uh, but it's more accessible than other techniques like MRI. MRI is probably more expensive and more difficult. But uh, with MRI, you can actually get very good resolution and contrast for soft tissues, which is not really possible with CT. Right? So uh, hemodynamics can also be observed using MRI, but it's a more expensive process and you cannot use it for patients who have metallic implants. But the resolution of an MRI is exceptionally high. It is uh, one nanometer, uh, right? So that is pretty good. So uh, ultrasound is a good compromise. It is very widely available. Uh, it is low resolution, uh, uh, but the bigger problem of the resolution is with respect to depth penetration, right? It cannot, uh, it can only look at uh, what is in a few millimeters in the inside, uh, from the surface. Video systems are also simple and uh, that can also be used for <clears throat> the external scanning of uh, images. So when you're talking about the next question is I was talking about is uh, choosing the 3D printing technique itself. So there are major, uh, there are many types of techniques. There are five different techniques which are mentioned here. The first three are more common. The inkjet, laser jet, laser assisted and extrusion are quite common. Uh, the cell electrospinning and stereolithography are not as common, but those are also techniques which people have been exploring. So we'll talk about each of these uh, and I will briefly discuss them. So uh, in uh, inkjet bioprinting, what is happening is uh, bio ink uh, is printed to a surface through some kind of thermal or acoustic means. 
so the bio ink basically flows uh, in this uh, particular uh, nozzle and it will either flow continuously or it will come out as uh, individual drops so the advantage here is a commercial inkjet printer that you use can actually be modified to be made into a 3d printer so layer by layer construction is achieved using an additional printing bed that moves in the z axis okay so usually when you are talking about printing on a paper it you only have x and y axis so here you also have a layer by layer construction uh, through the x axis through the z axis printing so there are two types of inkjet bio printers the thermal bio printers and your acoustic bio printers the thermal bio printers have an electrical heating system uh but the problem here is this will create uh bubbles and it can also uh, kill cells if it is exposed for a long time so it has to be like a very short exposure otherwise the cells can lose its ability there is also some risk of uh mutation and so on so uh with acoustic bio printing what happens is there is a piezoelectric material which creates pulses which breaks the uh, bio ink into drops by applying alternating voltage uh, basically the uh, size and the printing direction can be controlled uh, this is more suitable for printing with cells but uh, people do use thermal uh, bio printing in some cases so advantages of 3d bio printing is uh, it's very easy to modify a regular printer and it is uh, inexpensive it's simple operation and uh, it gets reasonably good resolution as well and it's a very fast printing mechanism so but uh, the disadvantage is it's a bulk it's bulky in size and very limited types of bio inks can be used and the cell density will be low in these kinds of things uh, but you will be uh, you'll also be producing uh, putting the cells through some level of stress especially with respect to thermal uh, printing so you also have risk of uh, clogging of the nozzle right? so this nozzle is very small and uh, you are having this ink come through this nozzle so the nozzle can actually get clogged very quickly so uh, if the ink is not flowing at the with the right viscosity you will have this problem so if you ideally you should have some kind of uh, ink which will be able to flow freely through the nozzle but immediately uh, acquire shape after printing okay so uh, then you have your laser assisted bio printing so this laser assisted bio printing is based on a laser induced forward transfer so uh, the lift system basically has these components you have a pulsed la laser beam uh, a focusing system which actually focuses the laser to the surface and then there is a ribbon uh, and an energy absorbing layer so that uh, so you have you have this energy absorbing layer here so that it does not completely the laser uh, energy does not completely fall on the ink and kill the cells and damage the material and then finally you have your biomaterial layer right so uh, the ribbon basically supports is a support for the energy absorbing layer and uh, the liquid gel biomaterial is spread over this metal and uh, the energy absorbing layer acts as an energy conversion to help in creating this bubble and forming the droplet and so on so the factors which control the resolution are the laser energy laser frequency and the viscosity of the biomaterial so the advantage is you can have very high cell viability and cell resolution right so the high cell viability is because there are no stress as such for the cells right so it is only dispersed in the material and it is no nozzle free and non contact printing so because it's non contact there is a, an advantage you can actually have better uh, control over the sterility of printing and because it's nozzle free you do not have any clogging of nozzles which will cause problems and you can get high cell density bio ink from this but the disadvantage is uh, there is very limited control over the directionality of printing because you cannot actually once the drop goes you cannot actually stop it from uh, the process and uh, there is also some level of damage because of laser and uv light which might be there and limited photo cross linking agents would be available uh, for creating this cross linking itself but the biggest uh, limitation is it's a very slow process then the more common method which is used is the extrusion bio printing so this can be used for any shear thinning uh, bio ink <coughs> so a continuous stream of bio ink 
is printed onto the design stage through a pneumatic or a mechanical extrusion system and uh, most commercial 3d printers for non biological purposes use this technique only so uh, this can be used for the widest range of biomaterials because here uh, the only parameter you are looking at is the viscosity of the thing ink so you can have a pneumatic system or a mechanical system so the pneumatic system uses a compressed air to force the bio ink uh, from the nozzle or if it so the uh, because of this there can be some delay in printing so because there will be some level some time taken to build the pressure and then printing uh, mechanical system uh, has more spatial control but it is more common um, to see failure of mechanical systems okay. so the advantage with extrusion by printing is there is a high resolution and high cell density and you can also use it for various types of uh, biomaterials the disadvantage is uh, there can be low cell viability because mammalian cells are shear sensitive right so uh, if you are actually putting a lot of shear uh, the cells can actually die so that is something which you have to try and optimize so the material selection would be uh, dependent on using a shear thinning fluid as i was saying so uh, does anybody know the uh, understand what i mean by saying shear thinning uh has anybody studied um, newtonian and non newtonian fluids okay so newton's law of viscosity anybody does anybody remember yeah, yeah. newton's law of viscosity yes, yes. yes yeah so what is newton's yes. law of viscosity so the viscous drag is directly proportional to the velocity gradient Uh, okay so uh, what is your uh, constant there the, the coefficient of viscosity yeah coefficient of viscosity is your constant right so if the uh, what happens in a non newtonian fluid is this uh, viscosity is not a constant this coefficient of viscosity is not a constant basically so you have different types of non newtonian fluids you have uh, a shear thinning shear thickening and you have something called bingham plastics okay so bingham plastic is your uh, the best example for that is your uh, toothpaste right so and there are shear thinning and she uh, so what happens with your toothpaste is it will not flow for some time and after that it will start flowing with the same uh, viscosity the same level as a uh, newtonian fluid right so there is like an initial resistance so that is called a bingham plastic and then you have uh, things like your uh, shear thinning and shear thickening so what happens is if you are actually applying shear then uh, the viscosity will reduce in a shear thinning flow so this is good for 3d printing because it's a highly viscous liquid now i am actually pressing it and applying shear to it so because of the shear the viscosity is low and it will easily flow out and as soon as it comes out then it loses the, there is no shear applied anymore so the viscosity increases so its fidelity is maintained so it will immediately form a structure okay so that's why you want to use shear thinning uh, fluids okay so yeah uh, so basically this is uh, the summary of various types of techniques which can be used so i'm talking about the bio printing is what we talked about other methods which can be used a porous scaffolds can be created using other techniques as well like uh, uh, electro spinning your phase separation freeze drying self assembly and so on but uh, what you see is currently the resolution you have for uh, 3d bio printing is very broad okay and you are not able to go for very uh, high resolution so i in the sense like the number has to be low for the resolution to be high right so like, you need to have something which is very precise and that is not possible as of now so once that get becomes is achievable you would be able to accomplish a lot more with uh, 3d bio printing okay so with that I'll, let me show a short video uh, give me a second so this is actually a 3d printing which was done in my lab uh, is everybody able to see this uh, video which i am starting yes sir so yes. as you can see here this is a this is an extrusion printer so you can actually see the uh, disadvantage which i mentioned about right so this is an extrusion printer using a pneumatic uh, printing head so there is an initial resistance you would see that there is uh, the ink is not flowing for the first few attempts 
so you can see that there is some resistance right and then once it starts flowing then it's like flowing beautifully and you can see that it is uh, maintaining its structure does everybody see that so this is uh, a printer uh, which we have basically assembled in our uh, lab and uh, uh, you can see a very nice structure which is being printed and it shows very high fidelity as well, right? It's not getting distorted. Whatever is printed, the shape is maintained and you can clearly see that. And that is quite interesting because uh, that is what you would want to accomplish when you are doing this. So I can show you some other things. So uh, let me show something else which has very poor fidelity so that you will understand what I'm talking about, right? So the shape fidelity for this is quite bad. So I am only printing a circle and you see that it is, there is no shape at all. <clears throat> the shape is completely lost. So this is an ink where the fidelity is bad. Okay. So you can actually optimize the ink to get better fidelity. So this is a different uh, model, which we are, are currently printing as well. So you have, you have used a different nozzle here. You can see that the nozzle is much more uh, fine tuned and you will be able to see a better control over the printing. It's very nicely printed, right? So you can create a vascular model. So uh, I don't want to go through this. So this is a, quite a long video. So uh, we would have printed a slightly larger tissue. So what you can see here is the high fidelity of the printing. You can even see that there is um, like structures which are just hanging there, right? So which is not actually supported in the nature. So if you're actually seeing this, uh, this particular structure, the tube is actually not supported in the uh, surface, but you can actually print it, right? And it does maintain its structure. So we are able to print these things and we are able to get these structures. So as you can see, it is like high, uh, high fidelity that we are able to get and better precision compared to the first one I showed, right? So clearly showcasing that uh, it is possible to do these things. And uh, so as I, uh, as this is, we have not actually published the work which we are getting from this. So, but we are in the process of uh, com uh, compiling all the data and looking at it from a, as a, a paper and so on. So I hope this kind of gives you an overview of what we have been doing in the lab. And I would like to thank uh, the speak the organizers for inviting me and uh, my student Lavanya for connecting me with you. And uh, also my other students who have actually been working on these uh, things. Also, the funding agencies which have helped us in buying these equipment and doing some of these uh, cool aspects that we are working on. Uh, so I think with that, I'll kind of stop my presentation uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. So I don't know, I, I've talked for like an hour. So maybe if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer some. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for such an informative and insightful talk. Now I request the participants to put their questions in the chat box and we will address them one by one. The participants can also unmute and ask their questions. Yeah, please go ahead, Soham. All these videos that you showed, there was a standard uh, pattern which was observed. But if you have to 3D print an organ, say a liver or a heart, in which the uh, tissues are uh, very complexly arranged, and you also need to introduce vascularity uh, uh, connections later. So how do you go ahead with that kind of printing? Uh, so what you do is you have something called an STL file. Okay, this STL file gives the uh, it's created by a uh, by a CAD. So that the 3D printing can be done. So the, the image, the videos I showed, uh, the STL file had to print that shape, right? So that was the input given to them. So you create an STL file and that STL file creation can, is done based on the images you uh, obtain, the imaging you do. Okay, so you can create an STL file and that uh, will be the uh, model which is used for printing. So you can do all the complexities, but as I said, the resolution uh, may not be uh, as high as we want. So uh, you would want to uh, keep that in mind while you're printing these things. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, sir. 
so my question is like uh, what is your uh, personal favorite uh, technique like uh, this uh, 3d bio printing or the convention conventional like a uh, top down approach using polymers uh, what okay so uh, see uh, I, as a scientist you are not supposed to play favorites okay so the idea is uh, use the best method for the application which is in front of you so you uh, you have to decide the problem you want to address Right, so you you identify some uh, challenge which is which is present. You identify the problem and you try to address the problem and use the best technique available out there. So uh, many a times the problem uh, might not warrant you using something which is highly sophisticated. And sometimes if the problem warrants something highly sophisticated, you cannot just say no no no. This is the easiest thing. I will just apply the what is the simplest method. So, for example, if you want to create a tissue with a proper vascular network, a 3D printing is very useful. But if you are only going to create a tissue which can uh, provide a support system, then you don't really need a 3D printing. You can probably go with something like uh, uh, your freeze drying method. Or see, if the, in some cases, you may want certain kinds of uh, alignment so that the cells will grow in a particular direction. So for something like that, uh, electro spinning is probably um, more advantageous, and you would want to stick to that rather than use uh, 3D printing, which is more complicated. Right? So it just depends on uh, the application, and that's what you would have to go with. So I have worked with multiple of these, and uh, yeah. So depending on the application, I would usually choose the method. Uh, sir, uh, Ashwarya Swai is asking, uh, what are the ethical issues related to 3D bioprinting? She has asked in the in this question. Okay, so uh, 3D printing per se does not have ethical issues. The ethical issues are more broad with respect to uh, tissue engineering itself, right? So if you are going to use uh, create tissues, then you are, you have certain ethical. Uh, aspects that you have to be careful about. You do not want to, uh, the first thing which you want to be clear about is uh, your uh, informed consent, okay? So whatever you are doing, uh, you have to, uh, you have to get informed consent from the pa uh, participants who are involved. That has to be there. And then you have other questions like, are you going to be looking to uh, restore tissues or enhance tissues? See, as of now, enhancing tissues uh, is a can actually be a problem. Okay, so you uh, most focus is on restoring tissue functionality. So enhancing tissue, you never know what the side effects could be. So you may not want to do that. So those are the kinds of things which you want to work with. And again, then the choice of cells, right? That's uh, that's again a big uh, ethical question. So do you want to work with uh, stem cells or do you want to work with uh, adult cells? And if you're going to work with stem cells, are you going to work with embryonic stem cells? Because embryonic stem cells come with their own set of uh, ethical questions, right? So all stem cells have some ethical questions because there is a risk of uh, cancer uh, and cancer formation, which is teratoma formation with respect to uh, some types of stem cells like iPSCs and embryonic stem cells. And then you also have uh, embryonic stem cells where there is a debate about uh, destroying the embryo for collecting cells. So there are many such questions, which is actually one of the more fascinating uh, debates we have with respect to what to do with tissue engineering. Um, so, yeah. So since you mentioned stem cells, like uh, with regenerative properties, I recently was reading an article on um, how liver cells have, you know, some like they can regenerate. So they have some may have some similarities with stem cells. So would 3D printing be a good way to study what happens during disease or when the liver starts to regenerate? So, uh, yeah, you can actually create um, liver tissue models to try and study the developmental biology behind uh, liver regeneration. It is theoretically possible. Uh, I know a lot of people work on developing uh, liver tissue models, but usually they work on uh, trying to understand uh, pathophysiology of uh, things like liver cancer or uh, 
like uh, alcohol liver cirrhosis and things like that i have not come across papers where they focus on the developmental biology of liver but that's also because that's not my area of expertise i might i might not have actually done an extensive extensive literature review on uh, developmental biology of liver uh, but yes it is theoretically possible to do that as uh, on to the next question this is asked by ghansham kumar which scaffold technique is is best for making artificial organs can we use electro spinning for this purpose sir would you like to uh, uh, answer this question sure so uh, see for uh, whole organs 3d printing is probably going to be a very successful method right rather than uh, electro spinning because with electro spinning uh, scalability is a big problem so you may be able to create electro spun mats but to create uh, a whole shape of an organ might be very difficult but electro spinning would probably be very useful in creating something like a cardiac patch or a neural patch and so on right so depending uh, but if you are looking for a whole organ then i think uh, 3d printing is probably uh, the technique which will help the most but currently uh, for whole organ level things we, what people use is uh, decellularization they take the whole organ from another uh, cadaver and they decellularize it and use that but the problem is uh, you, that creates a lot of uh, issues with respect to availability It, uh, the only advantage is you can kind of uh, minimize the chance of the immune immune rejection, but there is going to be a significant uh, challenge with respect to availability of these uh, decellularized organs. Okay. Are there any other questions? so yeah so so um because if we are printing an entire organ there are like different kinds of cells so do we also need to uh, use different inks and we have to specify all of that like which ink would make what type of cells when you are working on entire organs uh so see there is also a possibility of uh, printing multiple cell types along with the same ink okay but what you are talking about is even more complex where you are using two different bio inks and uh, printing them using two different nozzles uh, those are those are big challenges it's not very easy to accomplish them yet so as of now people try to work with only one cell type and even if there is a second cell type needed they will do some kind of co-culturing or seeding of cells later and so on that is what is currently being uh, tackled Uh, are there any, uh, any more questions? So, uh, I uh, I just want one more question. Is there are there any applications of uh, bio printing in maybe like drugs, like maybe drug delivery systems, which are like patient specific or you know organ specific to treat diseases that target like target molecules in our, inside our body? 3D printing for drug delivery. Uh, people use 3D printed tissues for drug uh, discovery, but I don't know if there would be like a major use of it in uh, drug delivery uh, because if you are looking to target uh, the drug, there are other methods which are used which are actually more effective with respect to targeting. I don't know if 3D printing is uh, one of the common methods used for uh, targeted drug delivery okay uh, moving on to the next question uh this question is asked by uh, preran komal chaudhriya 
uh, sir can we achieve vascularization while using metallic scaffolds for bone tissue engineering uh yes uh, it is possible theoretically it is possible uh, if you can create a porous scaffold if you are using a metal scaffold which is not porous then it will be a problem but if you can create a porous scaffold uh, there can be some level of vascularization that is what people are trying to work on with uh, magnesium uh, scaffolds so uh, magnesium is also a degradable uh, material so it would so people are working on using uh, magnesium based uh, scaffolds for uh, vascularized bones okay. uh, sir i think uh, we are done with the q and a session as okay. i as i can see no more questions from the participant uh, now i request the secretary of genesis ms sonam swarupa to deliver the vote of thanks to vignesh sir hello Sonam, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. Uh, now, am I audible? Uh, now I am I am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible now. Okay, so thank you, Srinivas, for the invitation, and first of all, a pleasant evening to one and all present over here. I am Sonam Sarupa, the secretary of Genesis, the bioengineering club of NIT Rourkela. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for this webinar to all the dignitaries assembled here. Uh, I would like to thank our chief guest speaker, uh, Dr. Vignesh Muthu Vijayan sir, who honored this function with his uh, insightful and thought-provoking lecture. Uh, sir, uh, I sincerely appreciate your presence and time from your BG schedule. Uh, unfortunately, the, this time because of this pandemic, we couldn't have you in person. But uh, next time, we wish for your physical session at uh, NIH Rotella. And I would also like to thank the professors of the BM department, uh, the students, uh, participants from other institute, the whole Genesis members, uh, the host of the event, and last but not the least, our beloved audience for making this webinar a grand success. Uh, once again, I thank one and all for making this webinar a grand success. Uh, also, as the next event will be the paper presentation competition, I wish every participant all the best and I hope uh, everyone will get to learn a lot of new things. Uh, so, yeah, thank you everyone for joining and see you all there in our upcoming sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for having me. Uh, looking forward to meeting you all in person whenever possible. Okay. Uh, do well, all the best. Bye.
Pushuta, when we meet.